Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. This week we are watching Season 4, Episode 3, The Economist. It's a Saeed flash forward. Yeah, this is the one where uh, Saeed goes on a killing spree for Benjamin Linus, which was a little bit unexpected uh, at the time. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, We've also got the final part of our interview with Rebecca Mater, who played Charlotte Lewis and appears a great deal in this episode. It's a lot of fun. Let's do it. Sammy, what is your hot take on The Economist? So I've got two, both of which are pretty quick. Um, How about I do one, and then you do one, and then I'll do my other one. Great. First, I just want to say that uh, Jack has a line in this episode uh, where he's asking Frank um, if it's true that the Red Sox really won the World Series, which, one, I love because I love that Jack's still even thinking about that with everything going on, um, even though Ben actually showed him a video. So in Jack's head, there's some, you know, like debate going on here as to whether Ben somehow forged a video of the Boston Red Sox winning the World Series, which is awesome. Um, I don't know if that's really that. I think it's more just a a lifelong disbelief. And it's like, (laughs) wow, holy shit, that really happened. But maybe, maybe. Also a good explanation. Also, but I'd like to think that Jack is so distrustful of Ben and Ben's manipulative (laughs) abilities that that's in question for him. Um, But the other reason it stood out to me was just that Jack says to Frank something along the lines of, well, I can't believe it's been 100 days since I've seen a baseball game. And I'm sitting here and, you know, three months into quarantine thinking, yeah, it's about 100 days since they canceled baseball as well. So I uh, I feel you, Jack. I feel you. It's been too long. And that is my, my first hot take. Rosie, what is that? What is yours? <laughs> oh, dear. Not not nearly so. So on a completely different note, I don't know if I like this flashback. I think uh, maybe I don't like it. Or I'm sorry, this flash forward. Um, what? It's... You know, we it's Saeed killing people on Ben's behalf, but it's Saeed in like a bunch of very unexpected places. Like Sorry, let me try let me try this again. What? <laughs> I just you know, I actually watched this episode episode twice because when when it landed first, I was like, I why is that hitting in such a weird way for me? I don't know. So I watched it again and it's just like Saeed golfs? I mean Saeed can do anything, so I'm not super surprised, but like just seeing him golfing in the Seychelles is very weird. Seeing him, like, with his weird, like, half-straight hair going to the opera was very... Like, it was just Saeed in I... a lot of places that feel out of character, despite him never having felt out of character anywhere. That's interesting. I, I did, by the way, think that his uh, his straight hair with the tux was a pretty good look for, for Saeed. I was, I was kind of oh. into that. Mm, no? I don't agree. Okay. Um, well, I, no, I, no, no. I'm far just... from the expert in this area, but I, I liked not it. That I, not that I didn't like it it's just didn't feel like Saeed and it didn't feel like not like him in a way that the flash forwards are supposed to right like I feel like Jack's flash forwards still feel very much like Jack even though he's very different like it's all Mm. the same impulses that we recognize where whereas like the thing about Saeed is that we've known him you know we've known that he did work for the Iraqi army during the war that was upsetting in nature. He tortured people on command, but we also know that he's very troubled as a result. And, you know, there's that whole series sequence in the first season where he tortures Sawyer and then vows to never do it again. And in this future, he's just this like seemingly this sort of cold blooded killer. And I I know that this is a result of, and now I'm just in a full scale discussion of the episode, but I know yeah, that I'm gonna, this I'm is a result hold my of other, my other hot take till later. At this point, that's fine. okay. <laughs> um, I know that this is a result of you know Woodmore's men having killed Nadia, and it, that kind of turns him. But it it turns him so much that I almost feel like I don't recognize him. So that's very interesting. I I did not. I mean, I see where you're coming from. That makes sense. I I loved the flash forward, um, but in. But in some ways, maybe for for some of the same reasons you hated it, um, it does feel very out of place and very different for Saeed. You're right on about that. And seeing him at the golf course at the beginning, that the note that I wrote for that scene was the first the first sign that something is wrong here is that Saeed is playing golf because why yeah. would Saeed be playing golf? You see, to me, that that's part of the mystery of that scene. I see Saeed out on this fancy golf course, and I think, ooh, this doesn't seem right. Like, what's Saeed doing there? And then the tension, I think builds up really, really nicely where clearly when he says he's a member of the Oceanic Six, this other right. dude is 
kind of scared and intimidated and stuttering, but we don't know why. And it just builds very, very quickly to, oh, God, something's about to happen. And then Sayid pulls the trigger. So I, I like... I like that scene a lot. So yeah, I agreed that that's out of place. But then, you know, going through this episode and seeing Saeed as this uh, cold-blooded killer type, like, it's very, very um, jarring to to know that he's pulling this con on this this woman, Elsa, who for all we know until, you know, the ending um, is is an innocent bystander in this. Well, she's obviously not. Like, I was... I was very jarred by after Saeed meets her and then he's walking down the street at Berlin, you know, making the phone call to, to Ben that he's, you know, made contact and, and made the first connection here. He has this sort of, he, he flashes this sort of quick, sly smile on his face. Like he's very satisfied with himself for having fooled this woman, hmm. um, which was very surprising to me because that doesn't seem like Saeed at all no. to be, you know, smug about pulling a trick on someone. And by the end of the episode, it's he's, a very Sawyer move. Yeah, exactly. Well, this this is in fact a long con. You're you're right, which is a Sawyer thing. Didn't even think that's interesting. By the end of the episode, he he clearly has developed some some kinds of feelings for her, and and you know feels guilty and tries to get her out of the whole thing. But that's you know we get there. But but I, I guess the point I'm trying to get to here is that I think that the fact that this seems out of place and wrong and jarring does not diminish my enjoyment of the episode. It makes me really wonder what could have happened to Saeed to turn him into this person. And, I mean, the ending of the episode, we don't get the reveal yet of Nadia's death until the shape of things to come Mm -hmm. where everything comes full circle. But we do get a line in the episode, um, you know, on the island that's a a nice foreshadow where Saeed says, Forgive me, but the day I start trusting him is the day I would have sold my soul. Uh, and then we we get, of course, the reveal at the end where that is what happens. He's working for Benjamin Linus. So I I think right. the strong, I mean, the the explicit implication here is something has happened that has caused Saeed to sell his soul and become this person. Um, and yeah. I, I'm not, and I, I I wish that wasn't the case. I mean, it's not it's not exactly fun to see Saeed doing stuff like this, but I think it's compelling. I, I was very intrigued by it. I do think the episode does a very good job of working the parallels between what's happening on the island and the flash forward, especially when it comes to Saeed's relationship with Ben. Um, and of course, at the the very end of the flash forward sequences, Ben says to Saeed, Did I remind you what they did the last time you fought with your heart instead of your gun? You used that to recruit me into killing for you. Do you want to protect your friends or not, Saeed? Yeah, I think I think the source of my trouble with this is just like with the other flash forwards so far, and there have only been two, so there's only been Jack and Hurley, I can see how we got there. It's mm. easy enough for me to see how Jack progressed. You know, Jack, the sort of perfectionist, kind of obsessive, needs to fix. I can see how that leads to a place of sort of addiction and anger and shouting at Kate in an airport parking lot with Hurley. We know that he has a history of institutionalization. You can kind of see how he gets there. But Saeed, it just feels like such a break. Well, um, see, I I don't know that I agree. I mean, you, you referred to the history of Saeed being the, you know, the Iraqi army torturer. You know, that doesn't translate directly to cold-blooded killer. But mm-hmm. I I think that we, we, we have seen very strongly that there's a darkness within Saeed, yeah. that, that he can do things like this. I mean, we have the reference this episode where where even Hurley's a little scared of him and says, I saw right. how you broke that dude's neck with the breakdancing move that you did, oh, which right. funny line by Hurley, right? That, you know, referring to the events of, of Through the Looking Glass. Um, You're right. So I don't know. I don't know that it's that out of place. Oh, you might be right. Oh, no. I got to convince you to, to love this episode. my whole assessment of Saeed. Oh, no. Um because you you are right. Like when it is a battle, like a war like situation, the way it is in the season three finale, he does kill people, and seemingly it doesn't. I guess I just always assumed that he was more troubled about that, um, and maybe he is very troubled about it, and that just speaks to the the selling of the soul bit, right? Like, right. I don't like to do these things, but I well, that doesn't matter anymore because I'm seeking this greater revenge or whatever that might right. be. And, and I can see your, the point that I, I, I think that I would agree with, which is that it's it's confusing as to why he's doing those things because we don't know the full story yet of Nadia's murder. Right. Um, which which I think if you watch the episode with that in, in mind, it explains it quite well. Um, but, 
yeah, without that information, like I and and I, I love the episode. I I think this mm-hmm. is a fabulous episode, but I could see how without that information, or if if that's not front of mind, it might it might feel especially like what what's going on here with with Saeed. How did how did he go from the sort of evolved version of Saeed that he'd become on the island to this guy? Yeah, yeah. I I fear that part of the reason this episode doesn't quite sit well with me is that I'm thinking ahead to and this this was going to be my hindsight but what the heck <laughs> throw it all out the window this episode um i think part of me is thinking or feeling ahead to season six when saeed really does not sell his soul but become sort of consumed by the darkness mm. such as have it his is. soul ripped out of him violently right <laughs> his soul is no longer with him you know through whatever cause um you, I can almost see that here huh. and in this flash forward. And I think maybe that's why it, it disturbs me a little bit because I never liked that arc of the plot very much. But you, I can, you can almost see it. You know what I mean? You can. But I also feel like this is a much more interesting and ultimately yeah. believable version of that. Yeah, because there, like there's a reason for it. Yeah, not, not only there's a reason for it, but I just think that... I think that Naveen Andrews has more, yeah, he has more to work with and he's able to sell it a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I was, uh, I, I have a, con- so the one thing that I actually did forget that I have to acknowledge here to explain this point, I completely forgot that Elsa, the woman that he's, you know, pretending to date, all, turns mm-hmm. out to be a spy for Widmore's side. Really? Like, yeah, I, I just, I remembered everything about this episode except that extremely important plot point. So I was watching the whole time thinking like, oh, this poor woman, Saeed is so charming and convincing and I can't believe that he's pulling this off and she's in love with him. And it was like so painful to watch. And then when she pulls out the gun and shoots him, which again, I just had forgotten that. Holy fuck. Like what a good twist. It was a good twist. And it was, they did such a nice double twist in this flash forward with that reveal followed by the reveal that. Saeed goes into that weird, like, vet's office yeah, to yeah. get sewn up. And the person – they don't reveal the face of the doctor stitching him up for, like, four or five lines. And then, of course, the camera sort of pans up and it's Ben speaking in this very, very slow, creepy voice. And, oh, uh, that – it is quite good. I, I'm i coming around. It's a good – not only is, is – it's a – I mean, that last scene itself is a double reveal. Because, one, you get mm-hmm. Saeed is working for Ben. And then you stop and think, oh, shit, that means Ben's also off the island. Like – yeah. It's not just the Oceanic Six, because clearly Ben's not one of the Oceanic Six. Like, something else happened here. Mm-hmm. It's really good. But yep, there, I mean, something the, the, is playing out here in the quote-unquote real world. Right. Yeah. The reason I brought up that, you know, Elsa shooting Saeed in this context is just that I, I thought that the most redeeming part of this episode for Flash Forward Saeed was, um, I mean, when he, when he, you know, realizes what he's about to go do and kill the economist, one, when he tells her to get out to save herself and sort of, which is not good for the mission. Like he's own, mm-hmm. he shouldn't be owning up, you know, to who he is there and putting the mission in jeopardy if, if that's his main goal. Um, and two, after he shoots her, he's clearly very broken up. So, I mean, it just, it's interesting to me that it seems that she was actually even the better actor than he was. Like she, or the better she con se- artist. Right, but I just mean yeah. that she, it seems like she really felt nothing for him based on right. how quickly she reacted there and shot him, whereas he very clearly was, was troubled and conflicted and did feel something for her, at the very least sympathy, possibly more. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was somewhat redeeming after I spent the whole episode being, like, you know, upset to see how good Saeed was doing at conning her. It's like, okay, like, he, he comes out a little better than she does in the end, in my view. Yeah. Yeah. I'll allow it. Yes, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So I guess, I mean, we've more or less discussed the entirety of the flash forward. Do we have any other points on that that are germane at this time? No, I don't know that I have anything else. Just that uh, this kind of a hindsight, but I thought it was cool that Ben, uh, that Saeed in, in Ben's house on island finds the Dean Moriarty passport mm-hmm. that Ben later uses in The Shape of Things to Come in the episode mm-hmm. where he recruits Saeed. Nice little... Uh, beginning of a circle moment there yeah yes indeed yeah um, so well, to cool. the to the island so let's go to the island do you want to talk about naomi now because i got a fuck ton of thoughts about naomi which i could save for hindsight but and it might be a distraction from the main course of the episode let's do it now we're already here okay i got questions about naomi uh-huh um there has been a strange amount of focus 
in my opinion, on Naomi's dead body mm. over this episode and the previous one. I mean, last week we had Miles going and talking to her, which made sense, and she did the code, which made sense, you know, from the previous episode. Mm-hmm. But then this week, like, and, and last week there was also a conversation where Daniel Faraday is, like, insisting to Frank they've got to get her body back to the freighter and be respectful to her, and Frank says he'll do it, you know, in the next time when he has more fuel. But then, you know, why why is that not the end of it? This episode, we see her body a bunch of times. Saeed closes her eyes. He examines... Mm-hmm. Not only does he examine the bracelet with the note, you know, from the mysterious RG, mm-hmm. um, but then later in the episode, as they're walking through the jungle towards the barracks, he again is examining the bracelet and again asking Miles about Naomi. Um, and then at the end, there's, you know, Saeed insists that they take her body back because they have space. Like, they keep showing, like, they paid the actress, Marcia Thomason to just show up for this episode and sit around and play dead in a bunch of scenes, which I don't think you do if there's not a reason for it. Hmm. Um, And then in the flash forward, when Elsa dies, um, after Saeed closes her eyes, there's a a dedicated shot of Saeed looking down and brushing his hand across a very similar looking bracelet on her wrist. Mm -hmm to the one that Naomi had. Mm-hmm. And that's not, you know, like a revelation that's on Lostpedia. There's an interview, and there's an interview with Damon uh, mm-hmm. Lindelof from 2008 where he says that there's no connection between the bracelets and people are reading too much into it. But I, I, I frankly have a lot of trouble believing that. Like, why, mm-hmm. why are they going through all this trouble to have all this focus on Naomi's body and Saeed's focused on Naomi's body and what to do with it and the bracelet and showing this other bracelet... Like I, I just I, I there's a part of me that really feels like there had to have been a, a plan to do something additional with Naomi, whether it's you know whether it was a post death kind of storyline where where someone's talking to her ghost or her spirit again, or whether she was supposed to play a much bigger role, or if they were going to reveal who R G was, or if there was a connection to Elsa, or the fact that they both worked for Widmore, and and that maybe the writers' strike got in the way of that. I mean that's huh. the best guess that I have because this was the interrupted season where everything had to get condensed. I just the whole the whole thing where Naomi is still a thing at this point, you know, two episodes after she died, um, and the thing with the bracelets, I just think it's really interesting, and it makes me really wonder what what was supposed to have happened here. That's really interesting. I've never considered that. I don't know what's really going on with Saeed and Saeed's head about Naomi here. What the plan was for her? It just feels like there's this this big unanswered, you know this big open question of where would this have gone or what was going on, and I I struggle with it. That's very, very interesting. I think I agree that they are spending a lot of time with Naomi here. I guess part of, I mean, I know it's been three episodes, but only like 12 hours have passed so far in season three, right? Or, you know, less than a day has passed, Very short passed, amount of time, right? so. Yeah. I guess it's not that unusual that this woman's body would be still on everyone's mind just because it's such a short amount of time. But I don't, I agree with you on the bracelet thing. It feels very obvious to me. Um, The way the shots are bookended, the way Saeed is sort of the person who interacts with the object both times, like, (sighs) come on. Yeah. And they, they both work for Widmore in these certain types of, you know, kind of, mercenary ish roles. Um, it does feel like, eh, come on they're at least you, they wanted to give themselves the opportunity for that to be something. Um, and if it wasn't, that's okay. But yeah, she, she's interesting. I would have liked to have seen that. I would have been curious. Shout out to our uh, our listeners. If if any of you have ever seen this addressed by anyone who worked on the show, <laughs> mm-hmm. I haven't I haven't found it. I haven't seen it, but I uh, would would certainly be curious if this was ever ever discussed. I agree. The um they don't ever go back to Naomi, but Lostpedia does note that on the uh, lighthouse wheel in season six, Dorit, which is her last name, is is written as the name of one of the candidates. So hmm. perhaps that was their uh, very belated shout out to the fact that they had other plans for Naomi they did not get to. Good call. I um I just got to quickly correct myself. Naomi does later appear in two other episodes of Lost. Um, she appears in, yeah, she appears in a flashback scene in a. Uh, 
meet Kevin Johnson uh, as as Michael meets her going on to the freighter um, and one other scene. And then she also appears in season five, which I had totally forgotten, uh, in the episode Some Like It Hoth, which is a mild flashback recruiting him to the freighter. So nothing else is really revealed about her, but she does pop back in on occasion. Yeah. Where else do you want to go? Oh, gosh. Um, Hurley straight up tricks uh, Kate and Saeed, which is kind of impressive. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm surprised he went for it after he and Locke had that argument where Locke right. kind of shouted him down and was like, we're doing this my way and that's kidnapping. Yeah, and he does seem a little bit sad to be doing it. Yeah, he's apologetic, but still like, yeah. fuck that. Come on, Hurley, these are your friends. Right, right. And it's not even Jack, it's Saeed and Cade who you... Yeah, I don't know. I I was, yeah, I was a little bothered by that. I did... I did like, this is a little bit hindsight, but I, I did like in the conversation between Hurley and Locke, um, the sort of contrast between Locke's leadership style of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, we've got to, you know, we've, we've, we've got to show strength and we can't, you know, show weakness and we have having a prisoner is a better position to be in than just, you know, giving it up. Whereas, you know, Hurley's attitude is let's, let's do a show of, um, you know, a show of kindness and goodwill mm-hmm. here and give her up and then they'll leave us alone. Like, I, was, I found myself thinking, watching that scene, gee, this is why Hurley's going to make a good leader of the island and a much better mm. leader than Locke ever would have. Like, uh, it just, you know, I just, yeah. I like that approach so much better. Yeah, he's a compromiser and not an idealist. And not always convinced that he is right, which is the case with John and Jack. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> John um, and Jack, who either are convinced that they're totally right or convinced that they have fucked everything up and they have to grow a giant beard and shout at people at airports. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Speaking of other leadership conflicts, didn't you enjoy Saeed telling Jack, you're the not you're not the best candidate for this kind of mission? Yes, <laughs> and he was funny. right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Saeed promised sort of no blood, and he went in with no blood. He did trade miles, but... You I know, thought that did, was hilarious. He did what he promised. <laughs> right. <laughs> That, you know, they have a good flash, uh, foreshadow of that early in the episode where Miles says to him, like, don't think you're going to go get Charlotte without me. And Sayid just gives him this kind of cool, bemused look. And he's like, of course not. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that's the moment at which he arrived at the plan. I don't know. It's an interesting question. All in, no, all in all, I mean, a great Saeed episode because we're reminded that Saeed is kind of an independent actor here who has his own motivations and he's willing to not double cross exactly, but he's willing to act independently of either Jack or Locke. And choosing a side is not something that's going to be static. And Kate kind of does that too. I mean, she decides to stay with mm. Sawyer, although we don't really learn the details of that until next week's episode. But I, yeah, you're totally right. And I think especially about Saeed. I mean, we've we've talked before, as I recall, about Saeed being this sort of independent authority figure who, mm-hmm. you know, can get stuff done without being either, you know, beholden to Locke or to Jack. And I definitely think that, I mean, that's explicit in this episode. Mm-hmm. He, you know, Miles asks him, do you think we're here to kill you or not? After, after Sawyer, Sayed explains why the camp split up mm-hmm. and Sayed says, I'll, I'll let you know when I've decided. Mm-hmm. And then later when he's bargaining with Locke, um, he tells Locke that he, even though he's in Jack's camp, he actually agrees with Locke that these people aren't there to save them and he needs to find out more information. So, you know, he's he's got one foot in Jack's camp and kind of mm-hmm. a foot in Locke's camp. And it's it's very smart how he, you know, is going about things, I think. He's trying to work it out best for everyone. Yeah, and is trying to genuinely uncover information about these people, which... He seems to be the only person doing. <laughs> <laughs> right, how how he finds the photo of Desmond and Penny and thinks, okay, we need to get Desmond over here so that he can help us figure this out and go go see them. Like, yeah, he's, he's the only one who's, who's not just, like, made up his mind and decided on a course of action. And as a journalist, I feel like, yeah, going and finding more information <laughs> is usually the correct course of action That's in weird. any complicated situation. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, one, one brief thing about the the Sawyer and Kate scene. Um, Sawyer is right, right? About if Kate goes home, she's probably going to be arrested. And, you know, she she says to him, Look around us, freckles. we got roofs over our heads. Electricity, showers, beds. Yeah, how long, Sawyer? 
How long do you think we can play house? I mean, I guess, I guess you've only been here for three or three and a half months at this point. But you're all surviving. Okay. You know, not great. There have been, like, many skirmishes along the way. And a lot of weird stuff has happened and a lot of people have died. But... I don't know. I think I think Sawyer has decent reason for his optimism here. I guess that's all. Just saying like, oh, this this might actually be an option that's available to us is just stay here and see what happens. Yeah, I'm kind of of two minds about this because, I mean, you're right. Sawyer is, is accurate when he says that if, you know, what when he asks, what what are you going back for? What is there? You're just going to get arrested. I mean, that's 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 the plot of next week's flash forward right. is Kate's trial. Um, ultimately she, she, you know, gets off, but that's not something we can, we can really predict here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can see why Sawyer feels that way. You're right. It, it seems somewhat realistic. On the other hand, he's referring to like, oh, you know, we've got running water and electricity mm-hmm. and houses to live in. It's like, you did just get there like two hours ago or however right. long it's been. Right. You also have a smoke monster. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah. I think that that's Sawyer's fair. jump into some conclusions pretty quick here probably in order to set up next week's, you know, playing house storyline, which is not one of my favorites and I'm not yeah. especially looking forward to, at least in the on island plot. Um but yeah, I mean at the base of it, I think Sawyer's attitude of why why do you want to leave? You know, what's out there for you and I feel the same way for myself, like very good point. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, and I, I don't I mean, we know that Kate has thought about this because when was gosh when did this happen when she had sort of taken someone else's passport and was planning to sort of pass it off as herself was that way back when they were launching the raft in season one so this was born to run in season one. Oh yeah in prep you're right in preparation for yeah kate tried to gain a spot by convincing son to poison Jin's water in preparation for the trip she stole a dead woman's passport to assume mm-hmm. her identity i totally forgot about that yeah yeah you're right she has put thought into that yeah i wonder if she's still planning to do that now <laughs> yeah i guess i guess it just makes me wonder and we'll discuss kate a, a lot more next week i'm sure but it just makes me wonder like what was her plan or do, do, at this point does she just want to leave this place so badly that she doesn't care yeah. Maybe, but I mean, but yeah, but why? Why does she want to leave? I mean, does she, I don't know. I mean, Bernard and Rose make the decision. They say there's nothing better for us out there than it is here, and neither of them's wanted for murder even. As far as we know. As far <laughs> as we know, I mean, maybe that's why they wanted to stay. But, oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, no, good question. Yeah, I don't know. It It is, uh, that that brief, brief encounter with Sawyer did make me think for a while about why did she, you know, did she stay with Jack out of sort of loyalty to and love for Jack? Or did she stay with Jack out of the end goal? And I think it may have been the former. And here Sawyer prompts her to think about this. And she kind of thinks like, oh, interesting point. But again, yeah. we can discuss that more next week. Yeah. That, that, I mean, frankly, that's one of the things that annoys me about next week's episode. Could we get back into like love quadrangle territory? And and you see a little of that here where... yeah. You know, Kate is is you know given. Jack, I mean, the last two episodes there have been scenes where like Jack asks Juliet to do stuff, and Kate's kind of right. standing there looking a little miffed. And then this week we finally get Kate, you know, sort of calling Jack out a little bit, like, "Why do you, you know, for always telling me not to go on these dangerous missions?" But it also seems like she wants to use it more like as a flirtatious moment than as a serious like calling Jack out right, for his bullshit. Right. Right. Which I think is, you know, is her response to Jack and Juliet still kind of being a thing. So I don't know. It's a little annoying to me. I don't disagree. I'll, I'll never not be annoyed by the Jack, Kate, Sawyer. I mean, sometimes it's nice, but usually it's annoying. And anyway, what, uh, what do you got for hindsight? Oh, gosh. Well, we get a moment of, hard to, hard to really even call it a reveal, around the, the ash circle around the cabin or where the cabin used to be. Mm. Um, there's, you know, one shot where Block bends down and rubs his finger through this pile of ash, um, and seems to know that the cabin is not here. Um, and of course I had to lostpedia this because I could not remember why the circle of ash was significant, but it's because, um, it's a way to keep the smoke monster in or out. Um, the, the 
man in black apparently cannot cross over such a line. So either the cabin was protected from him or I guess he was trapped in this circle, but I think more likely the cabin was protected from him, but now it's gone. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then we get in season six, Ilana and Bram showing up to burn down the cabin um, after they realize that it's not protected anymore. Right. Uh, I don't know. Cabin fever. All I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not a, I don't know. I had forgotten in, after my first watch of the show, for some reason in my head, I had sort of stored the cabin as something that shows up much later. I'd forgotten that it, it plays. I mean, it's appeared in every episode of the season so far. Um, or it's been alluded to, or the, yeah. they're going there or they're talking about it or whatever. I'd forgotten that it played such a significant role. But anyway, yeah. what do you have? Well, I've already run through a bunch of my hindsight, but I got one <laughs> left. Uh, oh, good. Which, which is, um, which is that I, I was always a little disappointed. This is the only real disappointment I have about this episode that we never learn who the economist is. Yeah. Um, it just, there, there was so much buildup about this mysterious, you know, quote unquote economist character. And it just seemed like it had to be someone important. Yeah. Um, I kind of thought it was going to be Whitmore or something. And Saeed was just trying to get one step closer to him. And it, of course, we never find out, but. Right. And, and in retrospect, it probably doesn't make sense for it to be Widmore because Ben right. finds him pretty easy, you know, in shape right. of things to come, just goes <laughs> up to his penthouse apartment. But I am, um, I wanted to share that I, I mentioned this before in the pod. I am, um, I participated uh, for a couple of years while the show was still ending in these, these lost script writing competitions that the a fan website called Writers Untie used to run. Um, and I was pretty sure I remembered this and I went back and checked. I did, in fact, write a, uh, a script for this competition, which I think was supposed to be for you know our version of season five. Um, that is another Saeed flash forward episode where he finds the Economist, um, and in my telling, the Economist turns out to be the character Thomas Middlework from The Lost Experience, who is a uh, you know the alternate reality game they did between seasons. Mm. Uh, I think it was between seasons two and three. Um, I mean, it was between seasons one and two. I can never remember. It's Thomas Mid. Yeah, two and three. It's probably. after it's after it's after the blast door map. Yeah, yep, you're right. Mm-hmm. And Thomas Middlework is like this high ranking Hanso Foundation official who goes kind of nuts and tries to depose Alvar Hanso as the head of the organization and has these mysterious projects where he's like testing out strange poisons and people in Sri Lanka. Um, mm-hmm. And then ends and then it ends the story as like a fugitive from justice, having you know Alvar Hanso having restored himself. So I, in my in my telling. Thomas Middlework turns out to be the economist and he has an evil plot that he wants to kill all of humanity because he thinks the Valenzetti equation, which predicts the end of humankind, cannot be stopped and humanity cannot and should not be saved and we must start from scratch. And then Saeed shoots him in the chest and that's kind of the end of my script. Wow, um, so Saeed saves humanity. Saeed say, well, yeah, if, if you think he's <laughs> going to succeed, I suppose. Anyway, it reminded me how how interested I was in the uh, the Valenzetti equation at a certain point in uh, in my life, and um, that was my my fantasy <laughs> version of of finding the Economist. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I I think that's also part of why this episode feels a little bit flat to me is because, of course, the Economist turns out to be no one, or you know, turn, we never revisit this point again, um, which is kind of like. Oh, it was the name of the episode. We went through all of that for... It does feel like it's something that's going to be revealed down the line. Um, And, of course, instead what happens in Saeed's world is that we kind of move backwards in time and learn how he got here, which, of course, is more interesting and more important, but... Right. It's pretty cool that they did this story before the shape of things to come, before that flash forward. Like, I kind of like the doing of it backwards, so should we uh, should we go to Rebecca Mader for our, our last segment with her? I think that's a great idea. Um, as you've heard in the last two episodes, we spoke this spring with Rebecca Mader, who of course played Charlotte Lewis. Uh, she was a joy and a pleasure. Uh, we'll play that final part right now. You know, I want to go back for just a second because I, when, in terms of your your character, I was thinking that. You know, you say you wanted to be more part of the mythology. I, I personally thought it was pretty interesting, the backstory that, you know, you grew up on the island and had to leave and were trying to find it again. Mm-hmm. But I really would have loved an actual Charlotte flashback episode. Well, there was, yeah. Where we could have seen there, you. Yeah. yeah, there was supposed to be one. And then I think 
that ended up getting flushed down the loo when the whole writer's strike thing yeah. happened. We, I was going to mm. have a flashback and go somewhere and then I think they just panicked about having to... Because there were so many concurrent storylines, so many actors, so many things going on that it kind of just pushed my, my stuff off to the side, which was devastating at the time, you know, because I was hashtag invested, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea what the episode would have been about, what the story would have been? No, because I never knew what the script was going to oh. be. I mean, every time I got a script, a I'm shame. like, shit, I didn't see that coming. Huh. That's a shame. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, I was always shocked. I remember, you know, you didn't know when we were, what we were. And I'm like, wait, is it the 50s? Why are we in the 50s? Why is it the 70s? What's going on? I mean, there were, <laughs> there were moments in season five where there'd be like me and Juliet and Sawyer and Miles. And we'd all be like, like rolling, rolling. And whenever we flip, we, we flip to a different time. And sometimes we would go from day to night, night to day, from 2005 to the 50s, from the 50s to the 70s. And, and to get there, we had to just move our bodies around and like grab our head and be like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and we would all look at each other go, we look so stupid. <laughs> and then like, I'd be holding my head and then Josh Holloway would be like, Nader, you had the head hold last time. I'm like, too late, mate. I've picked it. It's like, what am I going to do? I'm like, I don't know, grab a tree. Not my problem, mate. I mean, we would be <laughs> hissing ourselves live and go, wow. And then sometimes <laughs> I'm like, we look. At, but then you'd watch the episode, you're like, uh, it looks amazing. But when you're shooting it, we felt like absolute idiots. And then I remember once we were doing one and I, and I, and I, and they're like rolling action. And I'm like, wait, I'm like, when is it? They're like, so I hear someone going, it's the fifties. I'm like, cool. As you were. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> hilarious so that's funny. so funny so disorienting but so funny yeah. <laughs> you know I'm curious. it was a trip the last thing your character says before you die is the you know the line about I'm, I'm not allowed to eat dinner. chocolate i'm sorry i should have let you say it. <laughs> i was just gonna <laughs> i was curious about that because that was i was at the um at the concert a couple of years ago at the ford theater oh i was um, there where michael G- Yes, I know. That was such That's an amazing. Like, do you remember? There. Oh my god, that was so cool. So it was the Lost concert, right, to celebrate the music. And then do you remember the bit? There was like this big crescendo, and then a real plane flew over the top of our heads. Do you yes. remember that? <gasps> yes, that was cool. It was like oh, that was. It was just like the finale of the show with Jack looking up and the plane and going over, and then a real aeroplane flew over our heads, and everyone went whoa. I mean, goosebumps, man. That was such a cool moment. I had. Fr- I'd forgotten that until this moment. No, that was amazing. Mm-hmm. I, the reason I brought it up, because I was just curious, when you went on stage that night, I remember that's what you said. That's the first thing you said into the microphone, that line, I'm not allowed to eat chocolate before dinner. Mm. Um, and I was just curious, was that like, is that a line that you hear from fans? Is All that a favorite for you? I All just, the time. Yeah? Sometimes when I do, a, when I do a convention, because I've done a lot of conventions over the past um, five years for Once Upon a Time, but... I do get lost fans that come up to meet me and I'll have like one or two lost pictures and then the rest is all my Wicked Witch of the West stuff. And often someone will say, can you sign it? I'm not allowed to have chocolate before dinner. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> all right, no worries. <laughs> Interesting. But I was really... I, I would was, have thought I this was, place um, is... I was really proud of my death. I call I call that episode my death episode. <laughs> <laughs> It was cool. Death yes. episode. Well, the, the title of the episode, This Place is Death, which is that thing that you kind of dramatically shout. I kind of thought that would have been the <laughs> been the line that people were uh, remembered even more just because it's so kind of jarring. Mm-mm. But no. I think I think because no. it's kind of disturbing, like as you're finally passing disturbing. away, it was like, as I died, I became six years old, which I thought was really beautifully creepy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it was really <laughs> it cool. It is creepy. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Did they did they tell you that they were going to be having a someone play you as a you know as a small child later in the season, or did you see that on screen and you were like, "Whoa, that's me!" Oh my god, <laughs> oh my god, I've got a story. Put your seatbelts on. Okay, click. <laughs> okay. So when I died, as I wrapped my death episode, and then that night I get an email from the local hire casting director saying. Do you have a photograph of you when you were six? And what was weird, <laughs> what was weird is that my mum had just emailed me a photograph of me when I was six. Like, what are the odds? She's like, oh, this is dad's favourite photo of you when you were little. It was like me at playgroup, like, <laughs> like this ginger bush on the top of my head. I looked like Ronald McDonald when I was little. 
And I'm like, how funny that she would ask that when my mum just gave it to me. And I said, funnily enough, yeah, I'll send it to you. And I said, but can I ask why? And she's like, oh, I have to try. She's like, I have to try and find a six-year-old girl with red hair and blue eyes in Hawaii, which is going to be impossible because no one's, you know, there's hardly any white people. And I'm white. I'm Northern European white. I glow in the dark. So I'm like, well, good luck finding anybody in Hawaii. And I said, well, I said, what's it for? And she went, oh, yeah, no, I, I need a six-year-old you for a flashback. And I said, for when? And she said, 1973. And I'm like, but how would I be six in 1973 when my character was born in 1979? Right. And she's like, oh, shit. I'm like, oh, that, that's, that's not... I said, you might know from this show that the fans will notice. <laughs> These are the most intelligent, oh, yeah. Yeah. rabid fans on the planet. So I emailed... Damon and Carlton and all the other guys on the show. And I'm like, hey, oh, typical Mader, I've caught a mistake, right? That's all I did. I did their heads in. I'm like, hey, guys, um, just a heads up. You know, I know you want this six-year-old girl to be me in an episode where, you know, it's 1973. But in episode 505, you know, in episode 402, I say to Benjamin Linus, no, Benjamin Linus said to me when he was he, tied he to a tree, all the details. he said yeah. her name is Charlotte Staples Lewis. She was born July 2nd, 1979. It was a line that was said on the show, my actual birthday. I'm like, they're going to know. They're going to remember. So I thought I was being like a really cool cat, like a real team player, you know, letting them all know. <laughs> Nobody responds. Nobody responds to my email. <laughs> oh, and it was, the, it was the, I remember, it was the day that Obama got, that won the election and I was driving to the airport in Honolulu. I'm like, oh, well, I've done my bit. Fuck it. It's not my problem anymore. I'm fired. I'm going home. Anyway, time goes by, months go by, and my mum emails me and she's like, loads of people are slagging you off on the internet. I'm like, what? Because my mum's got a Google alert set to my name. <laughs> so I'm like, why? So I, I Google it and it's like, Rebecca Maida, you know, changes timeline of Lost, you know, who does she think she is? I'm like, what? And there was, and I, I, I'm panicking, it's 2000, I'm sweating. So I go in and I look and it traces back to a Lost podcast and I, I, I buy it, I download it, I listen to it. And someone says, what's this about, you know, Rebecca Mader and the character, you know, and, I, and he's like, oh, you know, actresses, you know, they all lie about their age. And she just didn't think she looked that age. And I was, Wait, who said <laughs> it? He totally, the Damon or Carlton said Carlton said that. And um, ah. I was so upset because I had tried to save it before they even shot it. They could have changed it. So I, I wrote like, and I was really upset that I was getting all the flack when I had oh. done so much to sort of save it. So I wrote this statement going in caps on Facebook. This was like pre-Twitter. I'm like, I did not. And I'm like, I even have a copy of the script of when Benjamin Linus said this and I warned them. I'm like, and I'm like, they threw me under the bus. And then in caps, not dot, fucking dot cool dot and I hit send switched my phone off and I went out to dinner and got drunk I was so upset and then by the time I got home Damon and Carlton had done a massive apology and said we lied <laughs> Rebecca made us totally right we totally oh threw gosh. her under we totally threw her under the bus because we felt stupid and we are sitting here eating crow pie on our knees begging for forgiveness <laughs> They were really, really um, humble and actually handled oh it God. in like in a, such an amazing way. I was like, "Well, cool. Well, then it's it's job done. It's over, right?" And mm. then like the next day, the Inquirer called me for my for my. I'm like, no comment. But then like the next week, I was in the Inquirer and it says, "Lost Star takes on shows." bosses dot 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 and wins and then there's a picture of charlotte in the jungle with her hands on her hips like <gasps> with this like ugly pissed off face next to it <laughs> it was and i was so pleased with myself i cut it out and i stuck it on my fridge <laughs> this is so funny because i remember i remember now that there was controversy over when was charlotte born because it was known that that was a, a screw up but i had no idea this was the backstory of it that's that's wonderful <laughs> Good for you. But I mean, it's all water under the bridge, you know, like I see them and I get yeah. on with them and I love those guys. And it's it's a funny story that we have when we see each other now to laugh about. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, geez. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's been 13 years since since your audition. When you look back, what, what what's lost legacy for you personally, professionally? I mean, you've gone on to do sci fi and fantasy work. Um, all kinds of stuff in that space. What did what did Lost mean for you? I mean, my God, it changed my whole life. I think, I mean, it's crazy. 
it, I mean, I don't know where I would be or, you know, that's the great thing about this career path. It's like you go on this journey on a show and you move somewhere else and you have different relationships and, you know, I wouldn't have met my husband. I wouldn't have this baby and it's massively impactful. And I feel really honored that Damon and Carlton did see me and did pick me because it really felt like it was meant to be, you know, like I was meant to be a part of that show. It was a really meaningful show for so many people mm-hmm. and it, it just really moved people. And I, I know what they mean. And people say loss was really important to me. And I'm like, I know what you mean because I felt the same way. It wasn't like, Oh, thanks. You know, like, I'm like, no, I, I me too. So I feel really, I feel really blessed to have been part of something that's that special and was that special for so many people. Uh, before we let you go, any any other uh, recollections from the set that come to mind that stand out that uh, that we haven't already gotten into? You've told some very good stories, so I don't mean to ask you for even more good stories, but just in case something. No, I love it. I love it. I love a good story. Let's end on a stupid story. Great. Okay. So it was in like my first or second episode and it was before there was a prisoner trade because initially when I was captured I was with you know mm. Locke and everybody else and then right and they they trade miles for you as yeah I so before I got traded so I was still with Sawyer and and Hurley right I was still with those guys and I was getting on really well with everybody and having a real laugh and I drank so much coffee I really needed a wee so I'm walking into the jungle and we all used to use <laughs> Like, so the actors and the crew and everybody shared porta potties because we're in the middle of the jungle, right? So I'm walking along trying to find the porta potty, and Evangeline Lily walks past me, and I'm like, Where's the loo again? And she went, The wh- what? I went, The toilet. Where's the, where's the toilet? And she went, Why are you using the toilet? I'm like, Because I need a wee. And she went, You're in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Those porta potties are fucking disgusting, and you've got like 200 men using them. Just go behind a bush. And I'm like, Oh my God, you're a genius. What was I thinking? Why would I want to be in a stinky piss box when I could be under a beautiful tree? Evangeline is a genius, I'm thinking. So I walk along and I find a little secluded spot and I, you know, squat down, take my jeans down, I have a wee, go back. Months go by, months. And it was, we were late one night, probably drinking on set, and Josh said to me, Remember that time? It was like, your first or second day. I'm like, yeah, what? And he went, remember when you took a piss? And I went, yeah, what? And he went, me and Jorge were right behind you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so they, they felt so sorry for me. They hid behind a tree because they didn't want to embarrass me because I was new. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, what a horrible, ugly view. Like, I'm so sorry. They're like, yeah, we, we, did, we didn't, we didn't want to tell you because we knew you'd feel stupid and because you were new. But now you're part of the family. Except so now it's fun to you. make fun of you. <laughs> oh, oh, memories. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, it was good times. It was good times. But Rebecca, to, to wrap up, what a. Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I just like you know, it's. It's really fun to go down memory lane. I'm, I'm now. I'm seeing all these nights, you know, where we just sat around singing and drinking and having a good time. It's making me really nostalgic, and I, I really miss all those guys. But what's really cool is that I'm still friends with some of them, and I'm, I'm really still good friends with Claire, you know, Emily de because mm-hmm. she and I then worked together on Once Upon a Time for years. Mm-hmm. So we ended up working together for a decade. And now we've got wow. babies and we take them to the aquarium and it's, it's really oh. cool. It's like you make some good friends out of these shows. So it's been really lovely. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rebecca, what, um, that, this is the last question we always ask people. I know it's a little different in a time of pandemic, but uh, what are you working on now? <laughs> 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 what would you be working on if society was normal? Yeah, if we could um, go outside and... Well, you know, I've been out, I've, I've ha- I had to take a little break because I was pregnant. So oh, no yes. one was hiring a fat pregnant bird. And then I had him. And then I was yeah. like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the gym and bond with my baby and start thinking about going back to work. And I was just sort of starting to feel like, you know, because obviously it takes a minute to recover from childbirth. And I was just mm. starting to feel good and feel like me again. And I'm like, I just, I just started going on auditions. And then the whole business shut down. So... Mm. Mm. I have no idea, you know, once this is all over. But, you know, I'm excited. And and if anything, you know, I'm always trying to look for the silver linings and stuff. And it's just giving me 
more time to bond with my baby. And I feel like now everybody knows what it feels like to be a stay at home mum when you're just stuck inside all day long. Because I was doing that anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what's next. I have no idea what it's going to be. So just sanitizer and masks, wait for it to be over. And I'm, and by then I'm going to be really ready to go back to work. So I'm, I'm excited to see what's next. And hopefully there won't be any nosebleeds. Yeah. Us, us too. Us too. <laughs> thanks so and thanks so much for doing this. This has been wonderful. My pleasure. I hope, I hope that you. I hope that you enjoyed as well the chance to to look back a couple of years. No, this has um, been really nice. For us to it's do been really this. nice. I've really enjoyed it. It was really nice to meet you both. I love that last story about oh, peeing no. in the jungle. Just because. <laughs> Just because I always, I always feel like, do I really need to ask the any more stories you'd like to share? Question because usually it doesn't lead to anything. So like, oh no, you know, lost was such a great time. I've told you all my good stories. It's like, no, I asked it this time, and it led to the, the peeing in the jungle story. So, <laughs> well, and as, as anyone who has spent much time camping or hiking knows, it is almost always better to just go find a spot in the woods rather than to use the toilets or whatever. Oh but, yeah. Oh dear. Anyway. I um I very much appreciated Rebecca telling her version of the story of calling out Damon and Carlton's bullshit and blaming mm-hmm. her for their mistake. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember I remember it was such a kerfuffle among the fans at the time, like that they had they had screwed up Charlotte's age, but I just I don't know, I I I'd never seen that post that she wrote. So it's like good for you. Like that's what that's what you should do in that situation. Yeah. Very nice. Defend yourself. Also appreciated her Josh Holloway impression that she did twice. <laughs> Made the, her. She did that. <laughs> Jeez. Josh Holloway, if you're listening, we'd love to have you on the show. You can do your Rebecca Mater impression. <laughs> we do want to give a shout out to a podcast that Rebecca is currently doing. Yeah, a good point. We should mention this. It's called At Home with Sean and Bex. It's a, it's a podcast by Rebecca and her Once Upon a Time co-star, uh, Sean McGuire, who played Once uh, who played Once Upon a Time, who played Robin Hood on that show. And they're, uh, they're interviewing folks, and it's pretty, uh, it looks like it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's a good quarantine listen. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be watching season four, episode four, Eggtown, the Kate story that we've mentioned here. Uh, we will have the first part of an interview with Roland Sanchez, uh, who was the costume designer, a fascinating perspective that I had not heard before. And we are very excited to tell you for the first time here that the week after that, uh, when we watch The Constant, we are going to have a very, very special conversation with Henry Ian Cusick and Sonia Welger, who of course play Desmond and Penny, talking about that episode with us together. It's going to be a long episode, so uh, buckle in, but it was a wonderful I don't think anyone's going to mind listening to that one for as long as it lasts. It will be a lot of fun. <laughs> In the in the meantime, if you're enjoying the hatch, um, we'd love it if you could rate us, uh, whether that's on, and leave a review, whether that's Apple Podcast or uh, you know, Stitcher or YouTube or uh, wherever you're listening. We love and appreciate your comments and feedback and discussion throughout the week at facebook.com slash the hatch podcast and on Twitter at the hatch podcast. Our cover art is by Danny Roth. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. We will talk to you next week. Namaste. Namaste.